thank you for coming. Welcome to the Alma Mac. I'm your host, Adam, and today we have a very special guest, Hillary. Hi. <laughs> so you are a PhD candidate. Yes. In what department? I'm in the Department of Kinesiology, but I do my research with the Child Health and Exercise Medicine program in the Department of Pediatrics. Okay. So we've been discussing having you on for some time now, yeah. but it's really, really hard to get a hold of you. And well, yeah. You're not always on campus. No, uh, I'm not on campus that much anymore. So I'm in the fourth year of my PhD and I'm doing a really cool program that's funded by CHR mm -hmm. called the Health System Impact Fellowship. So I spend 60% of my time with my health system supervisor who is at the City of Hamilton um, Public Health Services. And then I spend the rest of my time here. Um, and that time, for the most part, is dedicated to writing my thesis now. Right. So, okay. yeah, I'm only generally on campus at most two days a week, um, and those days kind of sometimes fill up <laughs> with, because I am still a TA and other things. Yeah, that makes sense. So, you're in the kinesiology department, and you're doing a lot of health stuff. So, personally, I guess, maybe you think this way too, because I know you're a triathlete, but yeah. <laughs> when I hear kinesiology, I assume that you're in it because you want to be working on Olympic athletes. I get the sense that's not what you do. Um, no, it's kind of how I came to kinesiology and thinking that working with athletes would be really cool. I'd kind of been an athlete growing up. I did synchronized swimming and I had a coach when I was in grade eight to grade 10 or so who was a kinesiology student at U of T at the time. Mm -hmm. And I thought she was so cool and what she studied was so cool, especially when she could, we could be in practice and she would say, I learned this in class today. Can I apply that to what we're doing? Um, so that I thought the idea of like studying sport and science at once and then applying it to coaching and to sport was really cool. Um, and then you when wanted I your, your athletes to be your guinea pigs. Yeah, I mean, it, it, would, it seemed like a good partnership. Um, and then when I started um, my undergrad in kinesiology in my first year, I took a course called Physical Activity and Health. And it kind of like opened me up to the fact that physical activity is basically good for so many health conditions, for preventing so many health conditions, and that it was like this magic medicine that everyone should be taking, but really nobody is taking or not quite enough people are taking. Um, and then that kind of like deterred me from the athlete thing. That's still a little bit of what I do, but not so much with my research. When I realized that it was that we needed to promote activity and quality activity to everyone, not only the people going to the Olympics. And those people who work with Olympians are really good at what they do, so I will leave them to that. <laughs> <laughs>
um, toddlers and preschoolers studying allergies and asthma, which was not my expertise, but um, in one of my interviews with them, uh, one, they had said, they, were, they said, so you know how to make little kids do stuff in a lab, <laughs> which is what I'd done as a master's student, having little kids exercise and play in the lab. Um, and kind of the second they asked that question, I was pretty sure I had that job, and wow. I did. Um, I think it's not really a, it's a pretty niche skill. Like, they generally find people with lots of other science backgrounds or backgrounds in asthma and allergy, but not the, like, working with little kids in a lab. You know, you need to make them do stuff. You need to be a bit creative in how you collect things, but you still need to collect the data well. You need to mm -hmm. collect, have high quality data where it's not really meaningful. Um, so that was this weird niche skill that I didn't know I had gotten out of my master's. Weird, I would never have thought did, of that. Um, and it got me a job, so I stayed there for almost a year, and then my supervisor at Mac was hiring a research assistant for a new study he was starting, so I came back and then um, the next year started my PhD. Yeah, might have, hey, you're here, might as well, right? Um, you know, I say I was here, it, it, like, it was more of at that point I had some direction in what I wanted to do and what right. I could do, so it felt like the timing felt better. It was, you know, I kind of transitioned from being a research assist assistant to PhD student overnight, and my day-to-day -day duties changed a little bit, but mm -hmm. not that much. I think that's a really healthy way to go about it, and it seems like that definitely doesn't happen in the physics department. Yeah. People just start from their undergrad and they're yeah. like, I'm going to stay in school until I die, yeah. basically. Okay. Um, but it, being able to like pop out, refocus, and then really know that you want to commit four yeah. years or five years or however long it takes, that seems like super smart. I think it's really good, and I think what I didn't realize is just the idea of being able even though I came back to the same lab, but having that experience of working in a different lab in a different institution, mm -hmm. they did things really differently. So just kind of having that experience. Um, and it, it's especially hard when you want to stay in the same research fields, so you want to stay with the same supervisor, but if you're applying for funding, then you get penalized for not having experience somewhere else. So while my graduate research is in one place, I have research experiences from somewhere else that mm -hmm. kind of gives me a bit of diversity and the same with having my undergrad from somewhere else, somewhere else, I work with other people and I can kind of draw on how we did things in those labs rather than just in one place. And it's hard when you're in, I know a lot of people, they're in like, what is the best lab in the world for what they study, so why would you leave? Right. And it's, I think it's really hard for that to figure that out. Um, it can be valuable, but there is something valuable about staying where you are and you can be really productive because you don't ever interrupt yeah. that time you can kind of keep going those people tend sometimes have a lot of publications there's a lot of momentum with what they're doing so it's it's just a matter of what you're working on if if there seems like maybe there's an opportunity to pause because it's a there's not much happening in your lab then see if you can gain some skills somewhere else mm -hmm. but you know you can come back if yeah. once there is another grant and another project to work on it sounds a lot like the uh, the whole postdoc idea but yeah. before you got your dog a little like a bit. Pre-doc or yeah, something. Yeah, it was a, huh. kind of. <laughs> Maybe that's the way it should go. You should do like these little stints here and there before you commit to a full PhD. Yeah. And then you get your job. Yeah, right? I, I have a really hard time when people say, like maybe between, especially in academia, between undergrad and a master's and between master's and PhD, they assume that if you're not in school, you're like taking a year off. And I don't think at any point I took a year off. Traveled like, to India and like and, found yourself. And even if even if that is what you do, I think if you were like aiming to be productive with that time, whether it's because you want to travel or volunteer or work somewhere else, I just think I don't really like the year off. So like I don't think I ever took a year off. I took time away from here, but to do other things. Or yeah. between undergrad and my masters. I wasn't in school for a year, but it wasn't a year off. It was, I made different decisions to do other things for a while and then came mm -hmm. back. Yeah, that's a much healthier way to think about it too, I think. I just don't like the title year off. <laughs> yeah, if I'm laying in bed for a year, then maybe I'll call yeah, it a year off. Yeah, then you call it a year off, but if you did something or you were intentional with, you wanted to spend that time doing something, I don't think it's a year off. Yeah. Maybe a year off from school, but not from mm -hmm. being productive. Year off asterisks. Yeah. Okay, so we're going <laughs> to stop for a break. We have a little commercial break. And when we're back, we're going to talk to Hillary about the specifics of her research. Right. Right. So I'm going to... Okay, so we're back. This is Hillary. Hi. 
and we're going to talk some research. Sure. So you talked a little bit about um, what you do already. You're yeah. not doing a lot of your work on campus. You're doing it out in the field, so to speak. Yeah. Um, so I do kind of a mixture of field-based and lab-based stuff. Um, my thesis happens to be all lab-based stuff, but it seems kind of the other side projects I've taken on over the years, some that started when I was a research assistant here and not a PhD student, some that conti have continued or other ones that have started um, as a PhD student have been out in the field. And I think what's valuable about that is that people don't live in labs. I think in labs we can really control the environment and when we're studying certain things or certain mechanisms, um, that kind of needs to be done in a lab-based mm -hmm. setting, but um, some of the other work that we've done in the community gives us access to a lot of kids. So if we go to a school to do research, there's a lot of kids out of school. So we can have a much bigger sample size in way less time. It's, you know, there's no inconvenience to families to bring in their kids into the lab. Um, we can just go and collect a lot of information mm -hmm. at once from kids in the places they spend time. Um, so with that project, it's been a part, it's um, been a partnership with Hamilton Public Health for the last couple of years, and we've been going to um, elementary schools across Hamilton um, to look at students' health behaviors um, and measuring their heights and weights to determine their weight status. So. With this study, we go, we've got 21 schools participating and we have about between five and 600 kids. So if we were trying to bring those five to 600 kids in the lab, that would take a lot of time and a lot more resources. The scheduling would be a nightmare. The scheduling would be really hard. I mean, it's, you know, when you're working in a school, you're working in someone else's space and we do have to be respectful of that. And that can still be challenging to schedule, but it's still scheduling that one visit. Mm -hmm. um, and we've been going back to these schools um, twice a year. So now that we know the schools, it's a lot easier. But within about 45 minutes, we can have 20 kids do a survey, measure their heights and weights. And we've collected a lot of information about them pretty quickly pretty easily the kids get a water bottle or a frisbee or something fun <laughs> and then they go back to class and they're pretty happy with it you would never give them chocolate or something like no that. <laughs> we try and kind of align with if we are giving out prizes or something that they do kind of align with something healthy and you know this project in schools it's a lot of kids so we need a lot of prizes so something pretty inexpensive yeah water bottles frisbees you can get for like a dollar or two dollars and yeah. We just put our lab logo on them, and then we've branded <laughs> Hamilton with our lab logo. <laughs> Perfect. That's yeah. <laughs> best of both worlds. Yeah. So you said you're going into classrooms and measuring heights and weights, and yeah. that's a part of, that's going to help you answer a bigger question, other than um, what is the height and weight of... Yeah, so from that, we're able to calculate their body mass index and then kind of determine the number of kids that are normal weight or overweight or obese, and that's really a small piece of it. That information is kind of pretty good on a population health level. Mm -hmm. um, when, when we measure the kids' heights and weights in the schools, we don't tell them the numbers. Um, it's really more to be used at a population health level to kind of use it as a measure of health of kids across Hamilton, but not any of those kids individually. Right. Um, and, you know, we never would say this school has more normal weight kids than this school. It's really kind of more broadly. Um, that, question, that study does answer a bigger question that was um, related to a project public health did a couple of years ago called the Healthy Kids Community Challenge. So they implemented a number of health programs and policies within a couple of neighborhoods in Hamilton um, with some dedicated funding from the Ministry of Health so that we're measuring the health behaviors of kids in those schools as well as kids at schools outside of those neighborhoods. Okay, so you, the, the data you're collecting is sort of supplementing a bunch of ongoing things. Yeah, so it's kind of, it's to be the evaluation of that larger okay. project. And is there sort of like, could you use this data for other future studies? Is this just like going to be sitting in like a repository that you can apply it um, to? I think so. I think um, so kind of part of the um, fellowship that I'm doing with public health now is to kind of see how can we leverage this data that we have and make mm -hmm. sure that we are, it, you're right, it isn't just sitting in a repository. Um, so kind of pulling some things together now to do some reports for those people, the staff at public health who are directly working with Hamiltonians every day to mm -hmm. see kind of what are the health behaviors that students are doing, what are the health behaviors they're not doing that we want them to do, um, and sharing it, with, sharing it with kind of the research community, but also 
it's kind of like we have this direct bridge to knowledge translation now. So rather than us writing a paper, hoping someone reads it, takes this information and implements it, we can write the paper, we can present it at a conference, but we're also kind of putting it right in the hands of the people that we want okay. to read it, um, which is pretty beneficial. Like some of um, who I work with, there's a couple dietitians. So they, one of the dietitians is really interested in knowing um, about sugar sweetened beverage consumption because that's been something they've been targeting for a while promoting that kids are drinking water instead of pop and juice so they want to know you know what's our ba even just having this measure at one point in time what are kids in Hamilton right. drinking and you know where can they go from there is it something they really need to target or maybe the kids are doing pretty well okay um, this whole idea of putting the research in the hands of people who can use it right away is this like a specific aspect of the fellowship Program. It doesn't sound like a what I know of like a PhD thesis. It, that's yeah. not how I operate. Yeah. So basically. I mean, this is this is not in my thesis at all, actually. Um, but kind of the point of this fellowship is bridging that divide between health systems and academia, um, and kind of the benefits of it are to be twofold. So you can either do the fellowship as a PhD student or as a postdoc, and the idea is that you've got great skills in research and analysis and you can bring those and contribute to health systems which have um, kind of maybe less commonly employed someone who had a PhD or strong research background so that you can help with that knowledge translation evaluation research that they want to do but don't necessarily have the capacity to do um, and the kind of flip side of that is that it's benefiting these health systems because they are now they have someone who's part of their team who's an expert in research but also showing them that Someone with that training is beneficial to the organization, so maybe they'll keep having fellows in the future, or they will prioritize having people who've got PhDs working there when they realize that they kind of bring a really unique skill set that um, they don't, that that organization might not have. Right. Okay. The term "fellow" is kind of funny. I don't know. Yeah, it's a bit funny, but. <laughs> I feel like if they're naming it today, they would probably call it something different. I mean, it's a pretty new program, but there's. <laughs> I think they're calling it to align that with the other fellowship programs, which doesn't yeah. mean that it's the right name, but. Like bros. You have to like change Bro the name everywhere <laughs> so people understand it. Yeah, it's probably not the best Bro-ship. name. Yeah, I don't know. That's a, another podcast. Yeah. Topic for another podcast. <laughs> Topic for another, yeah. So if this isn't in your thesis, then what is in your thesis? Um, so what's in my thesis is um, our lab has a study called the SKIP study, which is a follow-up to a study called the HOP study. Um, all of our studies have We're ending acronyms. with jump, though, right? Uh, that's the goal, I okay. think, or something. Um, <laughs> so the HOP study started with preschoolers, and it was looking at health outcomes and physical activity in preschoolers um, over three years. So part of that... Um, study was the focus of my master's, so where I learned to work with preschoolers and toddlers in a lab. Um, and then the follow-up to that is a three-year study called the SKIP study, which is looking at physical activity and health outcomes in these kids for three more years. So now they're, um, the data collection for the study is complete, but when they first started the study, they were three, four, and five, and by the end of this kind of these two studies, um, the kids are anywhere from 8 to 12 or 13 years old, okay. um, and really allowing us to look at kind of how their activity, almost trajectories, what um, change over time, um, and how that relates to their health. Okay. Um, so my thesis is really focused on the second half of that, so the SKIP study and looking at um, their physical activity and fitness um, and physical literacy in those school age years. Okay, this seems like a lot of uh, stats handling. There's a, um, there's a lot of stats handling, there's a lot of okay. data handling, data management, I guess. Yeah. Are there, so do you perform any sort of like intervention in some of these kids yourself, or is it more like an observational? Yeah, um, okay. so this is observational, so the kids come into the lab once a year, um, and when they're in the lab, we um, do some measures of their body composition, they do an aerobic fitness test on a treadmill, so the kids run to exhaustion on a treadmill. That must be fun. <laughs> um, it's pretty fun. Um, then the kids do a test on a bike called a wing gate, which is like a really, really intense 30 second, all about as hard as you can. Um, and what's kind of really impressive about kids is they recover really quickly. So we don't only make them do one gate, wind gate, we make them do two wind gates with only a minute in between, which would be a really hard protocol for an adult. But the way kids' bodies work, they are, for the most part, able to do it. We measure their motor skills. We measure um, 
they do a visit where we measure their heart health and then they and their parents fill out a number of questionnaires about their quality of life and the parents fill out some questionnaires about behavior and temperament and kind of other psychosocial things that are related to or can be related to physical activity. Okay. And so what are you hoping to get out of um, out of this data? Is there like a, a hypothesis you're testing or are you hoping to be able to say something in particular or are you, are you collecting the data and then seeing what it tells you? And um, So I think, I mean, I think we kind of have a wealth of data with these projects and that there's a lot that can be done. Um, so in the very last year of the study, um, we added an assessment of something called physical literacy, which is in research a relatively new concept, and it's the idea that um, kind of physical literacy is your ability to move, your motivation and confidence to move, your knowledge that physical activity is good for you. So rather than just being active, it's sort of this construct encompassing that's kind of been referred to as like, that's the foundation to be active. You need to have physical literacy um, to, to be active and engage in activity for life. Um, so we added some assessments of this in the very last year of the study, and then that's what my thesis has focused around. Um, so looking at within just that one year, is their physical the measures we do of physical literacy are related to their health? So there, and then a few of the measures that we do. So looking at how it relates to their body composition, to their fitness, to their quality of life. Um, and then even one of my papers is just looking at how we're measuring physical literacy. Is it in it being new? So those kind of measurement properties of these tools. Um, and then the last paper, which the data is yet to be analyzed <laughs> and the paper is yet to be written, but it'll be looking at kind of the children's activity over time um, and how that relates to these measures of physical literacy. Okay. Um, I, I feel like in broad, like the, the very quick stuff I'm getting from physical literacy, I, I'm imagining motivation to exercise being like an intrinsic thing is an yeah. aspect of it almost yeah I think that's a, it's it's kind of all these things together it's mm -hmm. the idea that you know how to move you're really um, a com competent mover you can throw kick jump skip and everything but you're really not motivated to do it so even though you can move you probably won't or the flip side being you really want to be active and you know when my research is about kids and thinking about this in kids so a kid might want to be active most of the time kids have identified that you know they think activity is fun and they want to do it but if you're someone who's maybe a bit behind in how well you can move you're you're not as fast as the other kids you're not as coordinated as the other kids that may cause you to kind of like pull back and withdraw even if you are only motivated so right. you do need all these you know to kind of have that idea of someone buying into this idea of I'm going to be active and I'm going to be active forever. I'm not going to be active for 12 weeks to train for this race. I'm not going to be active just with my soccer team once a week. I'm going to make that part of my lifestyle. It's going to be something I do forever and that you need kind of these few pieces all together to motivate you to do that and stay active for life. That makes a lot of sense. It seems like maybe you can boil it down into two types of people that you see at the Pulse at McMaster, maybe like the people who show up in January to get fit and yeah. then stop coming. They might be low on the physical literacy scale yeah, for one reason or another. Yeah, Either they might be. It's it's really hard to know, like, and because it's hard to know where someone's at, but that, mm -hmm. you know, anytime someone's being active, that that's a good thing. And yeah. um, that if someone is designing an activity program or designing a study that you want to like build in something there to help with the sustainability of it. Yeah. So the idea of, I'm gonna, yeah, the, you know, 12 weeks, I'm going to follow a 12 week plan. I'm going to run a half marathon. And then after that, I'm probably never going to do yeah. it again. <laughs> and that's okay. That doesn't mean you need to do another, you need to go do a marathon after that, but you know, what are you going to do? Are you going to start doing Zumba? Are you going to do yoga? Are you going to go swimming? It doesn't really matter what activity you do. Mm -hmm. It's all good for you as long as you do it. Mm -hmm. um, and when we think about this with kids, especially with sport participation, it's the idea that if you've got all these skills to be active and know how to be active, um, that you can kind of switch between things. So maybe you do, you know, we all kind of know those kids who maybe are like a child prodigy at a sport and then they stop at some point. Um, okay, that's fine. You, you can stop that sport, but you, sh you want them to have the skills and the knowledge and the motivation to segue into something else, right. to go to a new sport, to go to a new activity, to be able to do things that are in sport, but also to do things that are casual. So play basketball outside with their friends, go for a bike ride. Like it's all good and it's, you just want, 
I mean, what I want is that kids and people have like this whole toolbox of all these activities they could do mm -hmm. um, and being will or willing to try something even if they've never done it before. Cool. Yeah, comfortable to try stuff, comfortable to move your body and do stuff, like yeah. you're not physically inhibited from doing it. Yeah. And also, like not anti-motivated to, like yeah. not physical activity adverse for any sort of mental getting your head around it kind of reason. Yeah, that you're just, you're willing to try it and you, you know, you might have areas you're stronger in, but that the idea is that you are willing to be mm -hmm. active in, and if your plans change, you can segue into something else or you move to somewhere with a new climate and running outside is like, it's really, really hot or it's really, really cold. Well, can you do something else? Can you mm -hmm. take up another activity and right. still be yeah. active, still get the health benefits of being active? So do you, do you try to boil this down into a number, like a one number that you classify people with? It seems very complicated. It's, yeah, it's really complex, which is, it's hard to measure. Mm -hmm. um, so what we've done so far, which I don't think is the perfect way to do it, I'm not sure if we know what the perfect way to do it is, but we measure um, part of it being the kids' movement skills. So how competent are they at running, jumping, skipping, catching, throwing? Um, and then the kids fill out a questionnaire about kind of their motivation to be active, their knowledge about being active, their knowledge that activity is good for you and is good for your health. Um, and also some questions about how good, they are, how good they perceive themselves to be at doing activity in different environments. Um, so that's kind of another piece, being able to do activities on land, in and on the water, on ice, on snow, um, just to kind of give you a bigger repertoire of what you can do. Um, and then we have the, the parents fill out a questionnaire of kind of their perceptions of the children's physical literacy. Okay. So, if, and there's some questions in there about um, how the parents think the children's movement skills are, um, and then also their motivation and knowledge to be active. Do you ever see like massively different opinions on how skilled, like one parent thinks the kid is like the most clumsy person in the world and the kid thinks that they're the most agile? Um, we <laughs> haven't really actually looked at agreement with that. <laughs> okay. um, I think a lot of sometimes what we get with questionnaires from parents is parents perceive that their kids are pretty great. Yeah, that which makes is, sense. I mean, that's I nice. don't think I can fault them for that. Like they that's... all think they all think their kids pretty good at it, oh, that's or nice. <laughs> you know, they they're sometimes a, maybe not they're like a bit more skewed, but mm -hmm. you know, that's that's parents, and I think that's, <laughs> I don't think we can expect them to. I don't really want them to be like super critical either. Yeah, that'd be brutal. That'd be the wrong end of to go. <laughs> so. How would, hmm. so could, we you do, rank your, could you we, rank yourself on the physical literacy? Um, so you can't really, you don't really rank yourself against other people. So okay. it's kind of like an old philosophical theory almost that everybody is on their own physical literacy journey across life. Okay. And that you're always in a position where you can kind of move things forward and you might have setbacks. So you may, if you have an injury or something, your physical literacy go may go down because now you're not motivated to do it. You can't really do it for a while mm -hmm. if you're recovering from an injury or something. Um, but that you're always on this journey and it's going to change. Um, like if you think about older adults, they move a little bit differently. Maybe stairs are harder for them. Maybe they used to do a sport and they can't do it anymore. Um, so it just it, that changes what they do and they're always on their journey and they're always on their own. Everyone's on their own journey. So it's kind of advised. Um, and what I'd want to do with any future work is that if you're measuring someone, you're measuring them over time. Right. So right, like just that one, that one time thing isn't really giving you the whole picture, but you want to get like a few measures of someone. And maybe that means with, from a research context, measuring it, doing some sort of intervention where we're trying to manipulate what kind of activities someone's doing or skills that they're learning, um, and then measure it again at the end right. or just kind of observational, what's happening, how is this changing over time, and then trying to capture if there was an event in there that really changed it, that they took up a new sport and are super motivated by it, or had an injury okay. or something that slowed them down from doing activity, but how does that kind of go up and down over your life, and then yeah. well, you end up somewhere, I guess. Right. But there is really no destination with it. Okay, interesting, that's really cool. So in terms of, um, let's see, it seems like we, we were sort of talking about the, the, the kid who's really, really good at one sport and then yeah. decides to move on to doing something yeah. else. Do you identify with that at all? You started with um, 
Uh, yeah, I've done a few different sports. So I did like in kind of middle school and high school, I did synchronized swimming. Um, then I started university and I like tried to go to the gym, but I had no idea what I was doing. So was maybe like that person at the Pulse who shows up and I just stopped going because I didn't really know <laughs> what I was even supposed to be doing there. Um, so then I took up water polo for a bit, which I guess I was able to transition into because I was really comfortable in the water and synchronized swimmers are really good at egg beater and water polo is a <laughs> lot of egg beater. So it seemed like a natural thing to do, even though I was probably pretty terrible at throwing. I tried water polo for a while. Um, it's really... Water polo is like very vicious and Seems very contact, high contact. And I was playing co-ed and I had a really hard time that I just, it wasn't for me within kind of that league. Maybe I would go back to it now if I looked into it, mm -hmm. but I had a really hard time with it. So stopped that, went back and did synchronized swimming with a few other people I coached with for a while. Um, a few years ago, decide, actually one of my old lab mates got me to sign up for a triathlon with her. So now I do triathlons, Cool. <laughs> um, which kind of came out of, I was like always fine with, I can do the swim part, I know how to swim. Um, and I had done kind of like cross country running growing up. Uh, I wasn't so into biking, but I bought a bike and yep, now fair. I can bike, so. <laughs> Weird, triathletes it's usually, oh I hate swimming, but I'll swim. Yeah, I'm really impressed by people who go into triathlon who've never swam before. If people will sign up for an Ironman and they'll say like, oh, I don't know how to do front crawl. So you know you got to swim like 5K. Almost. Yeah, it's far. <laughs> um, so I'm really impressed by the people who take up that. And a lot of that, like there's a lot of fear with swimming if you're not comfortable with it, especially in open water. Yeah, so you when people- can't drown on the bike. <laughs> no, when people, I mean, bikes can be dangerous in their own way, but when people do that without knowing how to swim, I'm like, they're, they're clearly really motivated to do that. And even if they don't know how to swim, yeah. their mo that motivation is enough that they're going to do it. So they would rank, so so maybe we can like look at your sport history and rank, <laughs> and sort of rank like a physical literacy yeah. type thing. You think you were at an all-time low maybe when you were going to the gym and trying to figure stuff out? Um, yeah, that was probably like a lowest point. I would still run then, so I felt like that was pretty good, but okay. I thought that like I should lift weights, but I didn't know how to lift weights. Okay. So, like, physically, nothing had really changed, but sort of motivationally, maybe yeah, there and, wasn't any direction. And so. I think that happens kind of a lot in any sort of, like, life transition, is what you used to do, you can't do it anymore. Mm -hmm. So, but do you have the skills, knowledge, motivation to segue to something else, to realize, you know what, I know I'm supposed to be active, I liked being active, this going to the gym thing isn't working, okay, and I saw a poster for, like, join our water polo club. Right. So if it ended up turning into a long-term setback, then you would have said that the yeah, maybe. would have went down. But it seems like you, you sort of plowed through. I yeah. mean, it, yeah, it's hard <laughs> to think about the specifics now, but... Yeah, yeah. Um, and of I, course, micromanaging this sort of quantity is probably not the right way to look at it. Yeah. It's probably like a long-term type It's more of a, like, it's, it, thing. it's a thing. Like, it's all like, it should always be... It's like, there's, it's a, it's a long game. Like, activity is a lifelong long game right so you can have periods where you get really into something if you are training for something obviously mm -hmm. but at the same time it's a long game like this isn't something it should never be a quick fix it should never be i'm going to do this mm -hmm. have some sort of benefit that i want and then think that i will keep that benefit if i stop makes sense yeah makes sense okay so we're pretty much out of time for the show but i okay. did say i was going to ask you about uh, anti-bullying stuff. Yeah. Today's a special day. Today's a special day. So I'm wearing a pink shirt that says splash kindness everywhere. Um, I, out of outside of academia, I'm on the board of directors of Ontario Artistic Swimming, which is the provincial sport body for what used to be called synchronized swimming and is now artistic swimming, if you didn't know. Lots of people don't know. <laughs> um, so kind of today is pink shirt day it's in sport it's in schools it's kind of across sectors but um, I think especially in sport there's been a lot of stuff in the media lately that's kind of giving sport a bad name for there being situations usually where someone in power for the most part what we see is coaches taking advantage um, assaulting abusing those people that they have power over and for the most part that's athletes um, so the idea of pink shirt day is you know, as our shirts are saying, 
splash kindness, but it's the idea that it's, you know, we want people to be kind, we want people to be inclusive. Um, I think the biggest thing in sport or any setting with bullying is that idea of like, if you experience something, if you see something, if you hear something, um, like be brave and stand up. And I think the message to get to athletes or anyone who's in that situation is, you know, speak up. Maybe the first person you tell won't help you. Mm -hmm. You know, we hear a lot of when this stuff gets to the news, it's someone said this was going on. They told someone that person either wasn't able to help or didn't really help them. And then they might be afraid to speak up again if that first person doesn't listen. But like, keep speaking up. Somebody will listen. Somebody will help you if you feel like you're in a situation or, you know, someone who's in a bad situation. They probably are. Mm -hmm. So it's just to raise awareness of that, that sport should be and could be a really, really good thing. And it's horrible that these things happen so let's kind of stop it from happening and if something bad is happening like be that voice for yourself for your teammate for anybody that you're in sport with that they can speak up yeah that sounds a lot like um if you're in academia and your supervisor yeah. is pulling you or something that's supposed to be your first point of contact yeah. if your coach is doing that yeah, who are you supposed to talk exactly to? it's hard so it's i think raising this awareness so having groups like your provincial sport body saying like we stand behind you we support you so you reach out to them or knowing if you're a kid who's an athlete to another parent to your teammate um and trying to realize like no no this is a zero tolerance it doesn't matter if and it's hard if you know what happens often is there is this power dynamic and you worry that if you get them in trouble, then it will hurt you and it will hurt your chances of advancing in sport. And that's a terrible, really hard position to be in, but understanding that it's more important that nobody's getting hurt mm -hmm. and that if that person is actually hurting you, you will be supported and you can get a new coach, you can get a new click. There's ways to keep moving forward and that mm -hmm. it, the consequences can, can be little, they can be big, but that the that those shouldn't matter when something bad is happening, like with bullying mm -hmm. is happening in sport and academia. Yeah, that person holds a lot of power and you don't want to like nag on your supervisor or someone, but it's not okay. If they're doing it to you, they've probably done it to someone else or they'll keep doing it and just realize that like it's not worth it. Yeah. And so the, the pink shirt, I guess, is a nice reminder that this is somebody who you, you can talk to. I guess so. I mean, I don't wear a pink shirt every day, but right. we, got, we got these shirts and asked to wear them today. So mm -hmm. at first I wasn't sure. And then I thought like, <laughs> no, like this is a really, I, the more I thought about it, the more I thought like, no, this is something that, you know, remind people that if yeah. you see something, if you experience something, speak up. And if that person doesn't listen to you or they think you shouldn't pursue it, go ask somebody else. Yeah, like there's, gotta there's be lots of other people. It can be your teammate, your parents, your friend's parents. Mm -hmm. Like, there's always someone who will take you in that position, help you. Yeah. So just find that person who will. And hopefully you don't have to go through too many people to get there. Because then yeah, it's like a bigger problem. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank this you for really having fun. me. Um, you are defending somewhat. Uh, in the summer sometimes. Perhaps. Okay. So this might be the last opportunity to be a grad student on the other but Maybe. I mean, we'll, we'll try to follow along. You are on social media, correct? Yeah. Um, so you can find me on Twitter at Caldwell Hillary. And that's probably the best way to, yeah. uh, to keep track of all of the cool stuff that you do in the future. <laughs> Thanks. Um, or I guess maybe Google Scholar, I don't know. Uh, yeah, there's like a little <laughs> bit there, but. <laughs> all right, well, yeah, thanks again. And this is uh, the end of the show. All right, thanks. <laughs> <laughs>